Hello everyone, in this video uh, we're going to be continuing our little uh, DCS 0 to Ace series with the Yak-52. Again, this is the basic flight series, so we'll be dealing with the fancier airplanes a little bit later on. But for now, uh, for those of you who want to start from absolutely zero, uh, this is a great place to start. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that little Yak-52 mission we did today, and we're going to be taking a look at navigation. Now, in DCS, navigation takes a bunch of different forms, but fortunately, you have such a small world map that it's usually not difficult to get around. Uh, for this purposes, we're going to take a look at kind of the easy way, as well as a couple of the different options we have available for us on the Yak. Now, when we move over to the C-101, we're going to be getting some other ones. And of course, when we move over to the F-16, you're going to have a tremendous amount of navigational options at your disposal. It's always nice, of course, to uh, kind of know the basics. So one thing we are going to do today is that we're going to be doing a little bit more long distance than we did. I'm actually going to take my default mission here. I'm actually going to delete that waypoint in the middle. I'm going to take this waypoint here, and I'm going to click and drag it over to Galandistic. So what we're going to do is I'm actually going to be using a combination of both a dead reckoning as well as uh, using some ADF navigation, which is available to us on the Act 52 So scrolling in down here real deep, I notice the fact that there is a NDB here that has a frequency of 1000.00 kilohertz. If I actually go to this view, it's a little bit easier to see 1000.00. So what I'm going to do inside of our aircraft here is I'm actually going to go over to the radio button, and I'm going to dial in the outer and inner channels to both 1000 for channel 2. Now, if you're wondering what this is, this allows us to predefine our particular channel on the ADF, so we simply press a single button to go ahead and select that channel. Other ADF radios we'll see a little later on have the ability to actually dial in specific channels, but for now, that works pretty well for us. The next thing we're going to be taking a look at is how we're actually going to navigate there using dead reckoning. Uh, basically, what we're looking here is, is there any sort of obvious landmark that we could use for the purposes of kind of getting us along? If we switch over to this view and kind of zoom out just a teeny tiny bit, you can see we're missing some data there that happens, though, unfortunately. I'm um, just looking, looks, doesn't look like there seems to be a whole lot of roads or maps that we can really use. You know, there's not any strong, ah, here we are. We have this particular lake right here, which is probably going to act as a really, really solid waypoint. As a matter of fact, I like that waypoint so much, I'm going to make it one of our waypoints. So I'll go ahead and click on the middle of this lake, and we can see that our initial heading here is going to take us right along here. We'll hit this one, and then we'll go ahead and make our way over the mountain range here. Also notice that my mountain range has an altitude of 3,100 feet. So we're going to have to make sure we get ourselves at least 1,500 meters during our flight here. And of course, we'll take advantage of the radio station when we get a little bit closer. Uh, one thing we need to know, of course, if you're doing any form of dead reckoning, is you're always going to be interested in what the wind is. So if I come over here, uh, you can see right now uh, we have no wind. Uh, one thing I want to warn you about with wind and the mission editor inside of DCS is you want to be very cautious that it's in knots or meters per second. So be very cautious here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and keep it nice and slow. We'll do a six knots and we'll set that. Uh, and again, it's going to be the opposite direction. Look which way the arrow is pointing is where the wind is going to. So in this case, I will just say that there's a nice wind basically coming out of here and going this way. And we'll also say uh, 6,600 feet. Let's go ahead and say, I don't know, about 15, uh, 16, okay, uh, about 32. We'll keep the directions fairly consistent. And of course, if you wanted to, you can go to dynamic and you can really go nuts with this. But I'm not going to go too, too crazy with it. Uh, we'll leave the turbulence alone. Of course, we'll leave the fog. But it will be important that we know exactly where this wind is and how strong it's going to be. Because when we do our dead reckoning calculations, it's going to be important to do that. So now I'm happy with this scenario. Again, this is the same one we've been flying the whole time. Basically, take off from the runway, kind of make our way over in that direction. So let's go ahead and save everything, make sure it works. Go ahead and press the start button there. And now we are in business once again. So we're sitting here at the end of the runway. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure the parking brake has been set correctly, which it has. I'm gonna go double check to make sure my RPM settings are all set, that the engine's running at a comfortable speed to go ahead and get me a nice run. There we go. You can see the generator is now activated. I'm gonna make sure my carburetor heat is off. I'm gonna go ahead and open up all my cow flaps all as far as they can be open right now. Uh, one thing you can do, of course, is you can open up the top here to make a little, oh, look at all those wires. You can open up the top if you want to make it a little bit more comfortable, but everything's looking pretty good. I'll go ahead and reset this. Okay, so now we're going to go do a little bit of flying here. So um, we're going to be doing a combination of dead reckoning as well as ADF navigation. So to get the ADF set up first, I'm actually going to take my head over here. I'm going to press this button. This is switch control, which is going to give me control in the front seat. Now, the way this works is you want to be on the K-O-M-P position. This little weird little character is actually a Russian letter P. And of course, the H is an N, so this is an antenna mode. This is comp mode. So we want it to put it on comp mode. So again, you can uh, right click, left click to go ahead and get the position you want. Next, what we want to do is we want to dial it to the appropriate channel we want to be on. In this case, I want to be on channel two. Now, if I rotate my head back to the center, you'll notice I now have this little needle that's going to be representing where we're going to be going. In this case, it's going to be facing over in that general direction of our airport. Luckily for us, we actually get a signal of that particular station because remember there's a huge mountain range in the way we're gonna have to fly through in order to get to that specific spot 
Next thing we're going to do is we're going to have to confirm to make sure that our gyro compass is set up correctly. Now this is uh, one of those interesting little concepts that you got to kind of watch out for. The way this one works basically is we dial in the latitude which allows it to calculate what the magnetic variation is going to be. In MK mode it simply means uh, go ahead and use the magnetic compass. In gyro mode it simply says don't use the magnetic compass, go ahead and uh, just keep it as a gyro. In this case I'm going to leave it on MK mode because I know we're not going to do any crazy maneuvering, but you do want to make sure that this is set correctly, in which case if I actually click on my aircraft, this is the FT. 10 view, I can confirm that it's at 45 degrees, and I can confirm very clearly that's also at 45 degrees. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually come over here and I'll play around with these little switches. But for this particular system, again, I'm not going to panic too much. You can watch, see how this one goes, wee, and goes spiraling. So I can go like that and spin it the other way and let it go. You can even sit here and manually adjust it. For example, if I was to switch it to DG mode, I could actually sit here and watch this, wee. Now, if I let go, this is the new direction. It's face, um, pretty useless, right? So I can switch it to magnetic mode, and you can see it immediately snaps back to the correct position. So it's just something you want to be mindful of. The next thing we want to know as far as navigation goes is the fact that the magnetic variation here is going to be about 5 degrees, meaning that whenever we're pointing somewhere, we're always going to be 5 degrees to the left on our magnetic heading than we are going to be on our true heading. It's a little bit of a difference that you're going to have to kind of get used to. I'm actually starting to get really, really hot here, so I can't chill on the ground too, too much longer here. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and calculate what we're going to need to do in order to get to that first big lake here. So if I switch up to the tippy top, you can see I can pop on map mode. I can do sat mode. I can do any mode that I want to do. So if I flip over here to map mode, I can have a pretty good look of everything in our environment. Obviously, this is the big, 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 big lake down here on this side of things. And you can see you can't even see me on the chart anywhere. We're actually a wedged in right here. So we're going to go ahead and take off. And we're going to proceed directly here to this particular point. So if I actually grow up here and grab this tool, I can actually use it to measure my relative heading. So in this case, as we're going to go right to this point, that's going to be 19 nautical miles away on a heading of 246 true. 246 minus 5 is going to give me 241. So I'm going to go ahead and come down here. I'm just going to go ahead and rotate this needle here until it's facing right at the 241 position. Again, consider this a heading bug more than anything. And there we go. So that's going to be my initial heading after takeoff. Now, if we press escape and press the briefing button, we can also see what the wind is, in which case we have a 3 meter per second wind at 90 degrees. Remember, this is navigation wind, which means it's coming from 270. Zero, even though it's pointing towards nine or zero. Now, if we want to get a little sophisticated, which we should always get sophisticated whenever we get a chance to do, we can actually go online and calculate exactly what that means as far as what it's going to do to our actual heading. So let me go ahead and I'll get a copy of that online real fast so that you can all take a look at exactly what that looks like. There we are. So now I'm on e6bx.com. This is a pretty cool website. Click on e6b calculator. Remember, this is going to be our true heading, which we decided was going to be a two. What do we say? We'll go check it in DCS real fast. I'll go back to fly, F10, we'll go ahead and drag that real quickly. You said 246 degrees, 246. Our true airspeed, uh, that's going to be based on our current speed. That's going to be 125. Our wind direction uh, is 270. Our wind speed, remember, was 6 meters per second. That's going to get us a 11.66, which is going to mean our wind correction angle is going to be 2 degrees. Total distance is going to be about 20 nautical miles. That's going to get us a ground speed of 114, a flight time of about 10 minutes. Our correction is going to be 2 degrees to the right. However, remember we have to subtract 5.6 degrees-ish, which means overall we're going to be minus 3 degrees to um, our original position. So I'm actually going to come over here. So instead of 241, 242, 243, 244 is going to be our correct heading compensated for the wind that we expect to have. All right, so now we're going to put this all together and take a flight and see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and release my parking brake, smoothly apply full power, and off we go once again. Lift up the nose at about 90. Once you start feeling the nose get loose, go ahead and push your controller back forward. You don't need to do anything aggressive here. And we are airborne. Delightful. Uh, we're going to go ahead and cruise just like we have right now. I'm going to get to about 200 kilometers per hour. We're going to pop the landing gear up, checking to confirm that they went up. There's my red lights. Awesome. Once they're in the neutral position, we're going to go ahead and slap that to the center position so we're not wasting any air pressure here. All right, we are now airborne. Now it's time to go ahead and do some navigation. So we have two different types of navigation here. Remember, our first one is going to be using our dead reckoning. We're going to be heading on this heading that we pre-calculated for us. So we're going to go ahead and take a nice gentle left turn. And we're going to start heading in that direction until we find that large lake. 
one really cool thing you have inside of DCS is you have a kneeboard that looks a little bit like this. If you press and hold on the K key, you can actually open it up. And then pressing the bracket keys allows you to actually surf between all the different items you have here. Now, what makes it super cool is if you press Shift and K, it keeps it open at all times. So now I can go ahead and surf between the pages. Now, if you want to get even cooler, if I press Right Shift K, it'll actually mark on the chart exactly where we are at this exact time. In which case, this little purple box right here, the little personal echelon, is actually us. But before I do that, of course, I'm going to go ahead and reduce our power to get to our nominal settings. That's 80%. We're going to drop it down to 70%. And we're going to go ahead and reduce everything to about 75. There we go. Perfect. Okay, that should keep things nice and cool for us. Our oil temperature is getting a little high there. So again, at any point, I can press Control K, and you can see exactly where I am on the chart. Now, since we're using Dead Reckoning, I can look out the window right now and clearly see that lake that we are interested in traveling towards. And again, when you're flying older aircraft like this, there's nothing wrong with using traditional techniques. And again, all those techniques are covered in other videos as well. There we go. About 244 degrees is going to be about right there. Bring ourselves up a little bit here and give ourselves a couple tops of uh, trim. And now we'll go ahead and get rid of that because we don't need to look at it. We're pretty much on course. I'm actually going to bring the nose up just a tiny bit. I'm going to go confirm that everybody's open as far as they can get. Yep, looks good. And we're just going to enjoy our nice little relaxing climb here and get ourselves a little bit of altitude. Now, normally uh, when you're doing any form of dead reckoning, one of the most important concepts is going to be keeping time. Now, on this particular aircraft, we have a one timing device that we can use. This is an ACHS M1. These things are really, really rare. Good luck trying to get your hands on one of them. But they're absolutely great for the purposes of uh, timing what we need to do here. But before I do that, I'm actually going to make sure I'm nice and trimmed out in a very gentle climb here. I don't want to do anything too aggressive. We're already pretty hot as it is. The way this timer works is pretty straightforward. On the left hand side, you have the clock knob. If I press this, you're going to activate the top timer. I consider this the ET timer. You press it once, it pauses it. You press it again, it'll actually reset it. The one on the bottom activates the second timer. By pressing that in, you can see that I'm starting to accumulate time this way. Both sets of timers are perfectly valid and they work very, very well depending on what you're trying to do. So in this case, if I were trying to calculate, you know, how long is it going to take us to get to a particular point? Let me go ahead and give myself a little left foot here. I could actually come in here and I know it was about 10 minutes or so. Stop that and reset. Set it, I'll just set this one. And then when I see that I'm on this one right here, that means I have reached my destination. Now, the nice thing is we can actually look out the window and see very clearly where our initial waypoint is. And I can see looking down that it's at about a 240 heading. Now, remember the wind is coming from a 27, which is pushing us from this direction left. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and give myself a little bit of uh, rudder here. If it looks straight down, you can see the aircraft is being gently pushed off course. Uh, one of the nice things I can do here is I can actually look out the window, spot my waypoint, and try to compensate for that just by looking rather than doing any special calculations or anything that like that. In this case, take a look out the window. I'm looking right at the middle of the airport that we wanted to, or not an airport, the middle of the lake that we're interested in. I can see that it's staying basically where it needs to be, which is about what I expected. Go ahead and continue climbing. We've got about 500 meters of altitude underneath us, which is pretty good. I'm going to smoothly increase power just a tiny bit here because I do want to go ahead and continue that climb. Now, I'm noticing my calculated heading is not the same thing as what we've actually ended up going on for our initial heading. That's not unusual. And again, it totally depends on a million different little factors that are going to affect you. So it's important, no matter what you've calculated, that it actually lines up with what you're doing. One thing I am noticing, however, is that my little ADF needle is working perfectly fine, and it tells us that our destination is indeed over that mountain range. But remember, based on our current plan, we want to make sure that we're going ahead and using that one directly. All right, looks pretty good. We've got ourselves up pretty much leveled off. Bring the nose up just a little bit. This is taking a, an amazing effort to try to cool the oil back down. I'm actually noticing that my cylinders are starting to get borderline cold, but my oil is still tremendously hot. Uh, that's just going to be an issue that we're always going to have to put up with. Again, if it was a little bit cooler and not so much summertime, we wouldn't have as much of an issue with it, but I'll deal with what I can. So we're going to climb up to about 1,500 meters, which if you multiply by three, that's going to give you roughly how many feet you're up. It's about, let's say, 4,500 or so. All right, I'm actually going to have to close up my cow flaps, but we're starting to get just a teeny tiny bit cold here. So again, your cow flaps is going to be this one. We're just going to crank it down a couple notches here. Now that we're back in the green as far as oil temperature goes, but I'm going to have to leave that one alone. <laughs> Problems you'll have to deal with. Now, when you're working on the F-16, your biggest problem is going to be fuel. This particular aircraft does not have the world's most fuel, but it will be plenty for us to get to our destination. Looks pretty good so far. Bring the nose up just a little bit more. Remember, as you climb, you're going to slowly start to lose power because, again, the air is going to get progressively thinner on you. 
there we go. We're right on our original calculated course that we had just a few minutes ago, about 243 degrees. And I can see we're actually doing a pretty darn good job of uh, navigating the way we wanted to. I can see that our initial waypoint is a giant lake, and we're basically cruising right towards it. Might look like we're slightly off to the side here, but the reality is remember that wind is giving us a gentle little tug here. Once we get there, we'll switch over to the ADF type of navigation. Bring that nose up. You can see how when I pull up, all my fuel shifts to the back of the tank, and it gives me a totally different reading. I love that detail. And we're basically hitting the limits now of our engine's capability to produce full power. I'm noticing, even though my throttle is jammed all the way forward, that I'm only producing about, let's call it 7.5 on the manifold pressure here. Millimeters of mercury, by the way, in case you were curious. Yeah, this thing's starting to suffer a little bit. So what we can do is we can choose to increase our available power by actually increasing RPM. For example, if I went up to my 82%, which is my maximum continuous, I'll actually be able to get more power out of the engine, which will improve our climb rate a little bit. Keep in mind, though, that we're still going to be at the mercy of whatever we can do as far as uh, total power goes. And also remember, since we've increased our RPM here, this is also going to have a corresponding increase in temperature as well. Close my cow flaps just a tiny bit here. I can see they're absolutely perfect. And my oil temperature is in the green, but barely. Things you won't have to deal with in the F-16 or the C-101 for sure. There we go. We're just a little bit to the north of our position, but it's basically what we calculated it to be. Coming down to take a look at our ACHS, you can see we're just about ready to hit, uh, looks like about 10 minutes, which is uh, basically what we were hoping for here. Actually, I should say five minutes. Okay, we're going to continue climbing. Like I said, we need to get at least 1,500 meters underneath us. That looks pretty good. Engine's starting to get a little bit cold. Go ahead and close the cow flap a little more. Again, this one's a very slow acting gauge. And of course, my oil cooler is completely open and we're still that hot. That's yeah, just part of the game. Okay, so I can notice that my calculated heading is a little off to the right, but again, I'm going to adjust that based on where we actually end up, which is going to be in the middle of this giant lake. Now what we're going to go ahead and do is take a look at the ADF, which is another option we have on this particular one. Keep in mind the ADF is independent of whatever this is set to. So if I wanted to do something really silly, like I could shut this off and go and spin that around 30 times, notice the ADF stays perfectly happy this whole time. Go ahead and flip that back to magnetic compass mode, so at least gives us some reference. The problem with ADF, as you're going to discover, is even though this needle is pointing exactly where we need to go, it's going to be at the mercy of whatever wind we're going to have. Not the ADF so much, but us. So for example, if the wind is pushing from here and the needle points straight, you're going to watch the needle slowly shift to the right as the wind pushes us to the left. So one of the problems we're going to have is even though we can center this needle, it's going to be to try to keep it roughly on center depending on what exactly is going on. Now you'll find this interesting. I have the engine basically full throttle as you can see clearly and I also of course have my RPM at maximum continuous power. We're not having any issues as far as temperature goes or anything like that. However, I'm barely climbing even though I'm at 200 kilometers an hour. I'm actually going to close up the cow flaps a little bit more. Keep in mind my air temperature at this altitude is considerably less than it was at lower altitudes. So that has a big, big part in uh, why it acts the way it does. All right, we're trying to aim for roughly the middle was my initial little plan here. Looks like I'm just about to that point now, and then we'll go switch over to the ADF. So the way we're going to use the ADF is that we're going to make sure we're on the correct station. Of course, like I said, we pre-programmed that before we took off. We want to be on channel 2, which is what we dialed inside of the mesh and editor. We're going to make sure we have control of it. Or of course, we're going to make sure we're in comp mode so it automatically calculates for us. In the old days, you had to basically uh, control the little needle, and when the needle went all the way to the right, it meant you're pointing in the right direction. It was a bit of a process. Fortunately, yeah, we do have things easily. All right, we're at our altitude. I'm going to go ahead and gently push the nose down. Keep in mind, we've uh, gotten a little higher up now, so the aircraft is going to change the way it handles a little bit. This is very typical. We're right about the correct position, so now what I'm going to do is bring ourselves a nice, nice, gentle little left turn, and we're simply going to center the ADF needle, which is that white one that you see in the middle. The jerkiness, by the way, of the directional gyro is simply a function of the fact that as we're doing all this, the aircraft, of course, is bouncing around and everything like that. Okay, I'm now going to go ahead and reduce my power to get us a little bit closer to a pretty reasonable cruise. I'm simply going to back down my RPM until we get to about 75%. It's going to be right there. Now we're simply going to back down the uh, manifold pressure until we get to about 7, which is about right there. Delightful. Okay, so now we're set up for cruise. The aircraft is on now nice. We're going to go ahead and give ourselves a little bit of trim. You have to be very patient with the trim in DCS because it is so, 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 so sensitive. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring ourselves gently over to the right. 
And all we're doing now is trying to get this white needle to be exactly at 12 o'clock. And that's going to be our initial heading that's going to take us to our destination. Looking out the window right now, I can see pretty clearly that uh, those those mountains that we expected to be seeing. Of course, what we would want to be doing in the real world is we want to get out our chart and constantly be checking it. Speaking of which, uh, let's see how we did. Control K. Whoop. Let's see here. Look at that. We went right where we said we would and took our turn. We are killing this today. Nice. All right, give ourselves a little bit of trim. The engine's running very smoothly, but it's a, it's a little cold. I could probably chill things just a tiny bit. I'm not even going to touch the oil cooler. That thing is its too much work. All right, a little bit of right foot here. This aircraft loves to drift. So now we have to play the which way is the wind blowing us game. So remember, the wind is actually pushing us from 270 to 290. So that means over time, this white needle, even if we hold the same heading, is going to slowly go like this as the wind pushes us south. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to compensate by bringing the entire aircraft slightly, slightly to the north of that particular position. I'm not going to bring myself like this. That's probably a little bit too much as far as a correction angle goes. It's only going to be about a three or four degree. I'll bring myself back to the left a little bit here. In the real world, the ADF needle is never that steady. <laughs> right there looks almost perfect. All right, bring the nose back. So now what we're doing is we're actually crabbing for the wind. So the wind is pushing from here and it's pushing us this way. Where we need to go is basically going to be over here. And we're basically going to arc our way like this to get over to that particular spot. At this point, it's a good idea to go ahead and double check your trim to make sure it's been set correctly. It's always a good idea to keep an eye on your temperatures, which are perfect. Don't even need to tweak them. I'll go ahead and bring down my cow flaps a little bit more. Again, the uh, lower your cow flaps, uh, the less air resistance they're going to provide for you, which is usually desirable. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to follow this heading for a little while and uh, kind of see what happens. And I uh, will meet you in the mountain range. All right, looks like we finally got our engine temperatures under control. It's actually fairly reasonable right now. Well, I'm noticing it's getting warm. <laughs> you just can't win. Okay, so at this point, we're getting fairly close to our destination. I noticed that my ADF needle is uh, basically stayed pretty much in the same spot, so I've got myself at the perfect little angle here for our approach. And now it's going to be time to begin our descent. Um, taking a look at my fuel quantity, I can see that I have uh, 40 and 40, which simply means I have 40 liters in the front, 40 liters in the back. If I were to pop up my little kneeboard here real quick and press Control-K, you can see I've done a really nice job of staying right on our original plan, just using our handy dandy little ADF system that we built in. Fortunately, with this aircraft, uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility in navigation, but it's not tough to do. So take a look at our good old fashioned F10 map. I can take a look down here at Gelenzik, and I notice that I, the uh, runways basically run themselves in this direction, which we have as a runway a one, and you have a runway one niner. Since the wind is mostly coming from this way, we're gonna have to basically swing around and then come back down. So let's go ahead and begin our descent. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the throttle back just a little bit here and put it to about 50 or five. I'm gonna push the nose down just a teeny tiny bit. It's not gonna take much. And we're gonna get this thing coming down fairly aggressively. This is also a great time to go ahead and get everything nice and cooled off as well. Now, this is also a great way that you can see how the ADF works in action. In this case, you can tell that that needle is pointing right where this is. For actually to push my foot to the right here, you can actually watch the needle point exactly like that where the runway is perfectly centered. It's actually kind of neat that you get such a nice visual like that. All right, during our descent, we're going to take advantage of that big old propeller in the front. It's going to help slow us down a little bit. And again, we're going to be doing a left traffic pattern here. And uh, looking at the wind, actually, it seems to be favoring one niner. So um, we're actually going to do a straight in approach today, which is not too bad. A little bit of a left foot, right foot here. Keep the thing nice and balanced. Again, remember, the wind is coming from basically that direction. So we want to land in the runway that's going to be facing that direction. Like I said, it's going to be a runway one niner there. And pull my throttle back just a tiny bit. If we do that, of course, we want to close our cow flaps so that we don't overheat anything. Keep a close eye, though, because uh, the thing will overheat on you anyway. <laughs> and we're slowly going to reduce our altitude and our speed here. Good idea to go ahead and call them up on the radio. Gallon sick. Uh, the frequency is 126. So go ahead and come over here, do 126. Press our radio button, air traffic control. So they're giving us instructions. Uh, they want us to actually fly runway one, which is uh, interesting because that's going to make it a little bit more fun for us than usual. But uh, oh boy. OK, <laughs> whatever you guys say. One thing they've noticed is uh, they've went ahead and given us something called a QFE, which is the pressure for the field elevation. So we're supposed to take that number and dial it in here. So if we actually come in here and say QFE, we have now wrote this thing all the way to the QFE, which means when this instrument now reads zero, we're actually on the ground. That is a big difference. 
Let's put ourselves down onto the ground. As usual, we're going to go ahead and slow down first. We want to kill all the power. We want to bring our RPM up all the way. That helps slow us down drastically quickly. So I've set my RPM all the way forward. We can bring down our landing gear at any point. So we'll go ahead and pop those suckers down. There's that little pop, barber pole that pops up to give us a heads up that the thing has indeed uh, descended. We're less than 170, so we can go ahead and drop our landing our flaps all the way down. We're going to get a little nose up as soon as that happens. And we're going to aim for about 160 knots. I should say 160 kilometers per hour, my apologies. So I'm a little bit high here, so I'm actually gonna push the nose over and take advantage of this. This aircraft, so when it starts getting slow, the nose likes to wander, so you have to be kind of quick with the feet. There we go, 160 knots. All right, kilometers per hour, I did it again. And we're just gonna line ourselves up. Remember, with this aircraft, if you pull the throttle back to zero, the aircraft will stop flying. So the trick to doing a safe landing with this thing is to gently reduce the power. Don't suddenly just pull it back. All right, you can see we have ourselves fairly well lined up at the end of the runway there. It looks pretty good. Just a little bit more throttle, starting to get a little slow. Don't forget to open up your cow flaps because uh, you will be using quite a bit of energy on the way down. You have all that extra drag from your flaps as well in landing gear. Everybody's opened all the way. Yep, looks like it's uh, doing pretty good here. Pretty good. A little bit of right foot. Looks like we got a little bit of a crab angle we need here because of the wind. Looks pretty good. power just a little bit. Now you're going to gently reduce the power as you get closer to the ground. Nose comes up, slowly bring the power back, and as soon as you pull the power back the rest of the way, the nose comes down. Ooh, should have been a little smoother with that front wheel. Sorry, wheels! And now we have found our way to our destination, basically in the amount of time that we expected it to take us. Go ahead and hold that back. I'm going to go ahead and pop open the parking brake. Let's go ahead and see what we did for time here. Uh, yeah, not too bad. So total flight time was uh, roughly what we expected it to be. Uh, you can see that this clock is a great way, and again, you can see a pretty good thing for this. Now, one thing I want to warn you about is if you are going to be using the ADF in here, keep in mind you have an outer and an inner marker switch here. The outer switch simply means it's going to be the frequency for the outer uh, NDB. In this case, it would be this one right here. The inner just simply refers to this, but however you program it inside of the mission editor is exactly how it's going to be. All right, hopefully this video is helpful as far as giving you some rough ideas as far as navigation goes. Again, your best friend is this beautiful map here, and your other best friend is going to be this chart here that you can use in any aircraft. Uh, next time, we're going to take a look at something that's going to come up a lot, and that's going to be emergencies. Enjoy.